Well, Ron, look back on your career, particularly from an Essex angle. Um, it started 2003, um, and Graham Groach, no less, spotted your talents. Um, just refresh us, how did that come about? I think Essex were in South Africa at the time, weren't they? That's right, I played on a pre-season, they were on a pre-season tour and I was playing for Western Province in a, in a fairly strong side. Uh, I knew I wasn't getting a contract back in Cape Town. Um, and obviously did fairly well in, in those two games against Essex and, and Gucci and, and Paul Grayson came over and said, you know, we are aware that you have a Dutch passport, you know, what do you think about playing county cricket? Uh, we arranged a trial where I bowled fairly well on that, on that first day and a uh, contract got put in front of me. Um, obviously things changed slightly in those first three years. I had to you know, find a way of surviving in the game to start with, uh, which was obviously batting in, in one day cricket was, was sort of the way for me to go. Um, and then slowly from there, you know, worked at all the different skills and, and became primarily a batting all round. I'd say, you know, I still bowled quite a lot up till maybe three, four years ago and, and always worked on it. Um, but just try to be a cricketer that, that offered something different, that whatever you asked me to do, um, you know, I could get into a fight with the opposition and, and, and just keep us in a game and, and, and win small, crucial moments. Um, and I guess I created a, a little niche for myself here at Essex. So you did. Just back to that 2003, were there thoughts in your mind at that time of making county, uh, coming over and playing county cricket or were you, you had an occupation at home and were quite happy playing for Western Province? No, there was, there was absolutely no thoughts uh, about being a professional cricketer. So I just finished a, a rather tough degree um, and I needed to do a, a post-grad diploma in, in accounting after that. So I was going to take a year off and just go play club cricket in, in the Netherlands and work at a job, a uh, corporate job at Cisco. Um, and then this sort of came up in the week that I was leaving Cape Town. So, you know, I thought I'll, I'll come over and, and see what it's about. I didn't know much about county cricket. Um, and yeah, things unfolded very rapidly from then. And, and obviously cricket has now become my life for the, for the last 19 years. But, you know, certainly that day, once I knew uh, that things were over at Western Province, uh, I was getting to, to 23 years old. It's, it's probably crunch time for the contract in South Africa. And I'd sort of parked the idea of, of playing uh, sport professional, which was absolutely fine by me, um, and just you know, the, like most things in sport, the the luck and the timing of, of those things happening together in that last week uh, opened up the doors for for what was to come. Well, we didn't waste any time in exposing Ryan Tendulkar to the English public. Uh, you played in the inaugural 2020 game against Surrey. Um, what does better belief really is the batting order. I think you you were number ten in that game. Um, but then again, it wasn't. That, it was strange. James Foster batted at three, but Ravi Bapara batted at nine. And when you think of the way that those three careers, particularly uh, with Ravi and yourself, have panned out, to have them at nine and ten, probably a little surprise that we lost that game. Um, but you made your mark. Your first victim was one Mark Ramprakash. Um, uh, but you still remember that yeah, dismissal? Yeah, I, I do remember that dismissal. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess the first thing there is T20 was new and, and obviously from a strategy point of view, it sounds like it was an absolute train <laughs> smash for Ravi batting at night. Um, but yeah, I think also, and, and something that I always reflect on is the advent of T20 and me starting my career like couldn't have been more perfect. So, you know, the euphemism was that he hits the ball in, in strange places. Um, and, and it's one thing I could do was whack the ball. And you know, let's not forget in 2003, guys weren't doing that. You know, now everyone does it. Everyone scoops and everyone whacks it over the top to start with. Um, and back then, guys weren't doing it. It was a, a lot more sedate game, a, a lot more uh, traditional game. Um, and, and I think that probably gave me a platform to, to show that I could survive in this game um, and then progress myself from there to, to adapt to the other formats. Whereas probably pre two thousand, if, if you if you weren't adequate at, at red ball cricket, um, your career would, would be over in a, in a season or two, like like happened to many fine players. Forced your way into the uh, championship side of the red ball, still batting at ten. So really, obviously, we considered you were a, a bowler uh, primarily then, uh, but it wasn't long before you worked your way up the batting order, um, and in the end became a fully recognised all-rounder um, in its own merits. Um, you mentioned there, perhaps, uh, towards the latter part of your career, you were a batsman who could, who could do a bit of bowling and actually reinvented yourself as a bowler in the Royal Open Cup, didn't you, that, this season, the hand was forced there. Um, but, yeah, batting was something that you worked on hard in the next Ryan. Yeah, I lived with Grand Flower in 2004 or 2005 um, and 
you know, as a as a mentor and a role model, you know, he was exactly the same. Worked ridiculously hard his game. We didn't have too much going on socially back then, so we would come down to the nets and set up the bowling machine almost every off day, and then slowly start working around around the wheel of you know, can you defendable? Can you score off the cut? Can you play the bounce? Whatever it was, we'd attack something new, um, and slowly, you know, little by little, uh, started putting together a game plan that that could be effective and and could help me to hold my own in 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 the batting department. And you know, as the career stats and and probably more pertinently the, the number that I batted uh, in lineup shows uh, there was a gradual progression until I, until I sort of found a sweet spot that, that could work for me and work within this environment as a, a batter stroke bowler um, and just do small bits along the way. It's right that we should, if you like, give, encapsulate your career by the stats. 554 appearances across all formats since joining Essex in 2003. 17,046 runs, 348 wickets. Um, but figures don't do justice to the actual career of Ryan Tenderscala because I'm that um, you brought so much pleasure to people um, and also put in all the hard yards um, which have given you those incredible figures. Um, let's go back to some of the successes. Um, the Touch Sport League, I think, was the first time you tasted silverware with Essex, wasn't it? 2005 we won it and retained it in 2006. Um, and you got your county cap there in 2006. So I guess that was a proud moment for you, wasn't it? Obviously a very proud moment, you know, with Timmy and Mark Bettini on the same day. Um, it all happened very quickly and, and probably quite an unusual route to get it by being a, a white ball specialist, so to speak. Um, but I guess the biggest thing for me was in the 2005, that performance at Lords. So I played a handful of games, you know, still finding my feet, still feeling like a massive imposter in a, in a difficult environment uh, away from home. Um, and then that game at Lords where I, I played quite a crucial part in winning it. Um, and probably the, the, the biggest thing that stands out there is, is Dale Stane got left out of that team and, and I played, you know, it was going to be one of us. So to go with that extra matter there, and then I get whacked in the penultimate over by Scotty Styrus. Um, it just gave me so much belief. Uh, Goffey was captain and, and the way the guys got around me um, you know, made me believe that, that I could win games for Essex. And, and that's what it's all about. You know, do you, Your numbers and that are really irrelevant, whether someone averages 33 or 35, uh, it actually means nothing. But can you step up when it really matters? And, and that was a foothold for me to, to realise what my role could be at this club. and. Uh, and the fact that we went on to win as well, um, you know, was really, really special to, to me and, and, the, and the young guys coming through at that stage. A couple of things you mentioned there, let's pick up on them. Um, an innings at Lords, um, stepping up when it, when, when it was needed, when you needed someone to step forward. Um, nothing better illustrated on those two points. The 2008 French Provident Cup final at Lords with uh, somebody else you mentioned there earlier on, Grant Flower. Your partnership with Grant carried us over the winning line, um, and to win any trophy, but particularly at Lords, is really something special, isn't it? Yeah, the you know, I can actually feel the <laughs> the emotions from that day. Um, again, you know that that being pretty fresh, a uh, first Lords final, what a day! You know, having having half the crowd being Essex and then half the crowd being Kent, and, and a very good side. And again, probably our backs up against the wall a little bit at that stage. Um, you know, again, one of the building building blocks in in becoming what eventually became the crowning moment for for this era of players, which was which was winning the championship and, and the double in twenty nineteen. Um, but certainly for the guys who were around back then, those were those were massive moments and, and you know very fond memories of a of a career. <laughs> Being now been with the club sixties, did you at that stage now feel an integral part of the Essex setup? You mentioned there. Earlier on, um, you were still sort of feeling your way uh, uh, earlier on. Had, had you now s settled full time with Essex? You, you felt you were an established part and an integral part of the liner? I think getting the county cap was a, a massive part in, in, in getting that part through, you know, where you, where you feel you, you are a senior player in the team or a regular in the team. Um, to be dead honest with you, I, I can't sort of track how things were going in Red Bull there. But certainly as a, as a white ball player, you know, I, I knew that I was part of the core group of, of the team. Um, again, I would be a, a bit peace bowler, a bit peace batter, um, but we had a recipe, you know, which we rolled out for five or six years and, and was very successful. And, and yes, I did know that I was, I was part of that, uh, that group that was going to help us win one day stuff over that period. 
the success kept coming, didn't it, the following year, 2009, um, and an amazing uh, partnership with Mark Patini uh, that got us promotion into the first division when we beat Derbyshire in a hectic run chase. Um, I th don't know that there was many people on the ground, there weren't too many there at Derby, as a seldom is, uh, but I don't think it was too many people that believed we could actually achieve that, but you and Mark Platini certainly did, um, and that was a tremendous day, that will stay long in your memory, won't it, right? It was, uh, you know, my, my memories of, of Div 2 cricket was that we were always just a little bit short, um, and that was a big moment, you know, obviously we came straight back down the next year and were, were wholly inadequate, we, we weren't up to... Um, you know, being a Div 1 side and, and probably the nature of getting into Div 1, you know, by, by declaration score, albeit a, a tough chase. Um, but yeah, again, one of the, you know, the really fond memories I can vividly remember sitting in that little change room in, in Derby and was still the, the days of teletext, you know, and we'd, we'd watch and we'd, it would flip round and round and the league table would come up. Um, we still had a game to play the following day at Yorkshire, but we, we certainly celebrated very well that, that day and, and, you know, one of the, again, one of the stepping stones or the, or the milestones along the way to, to what has eventually become you know proper success what we, we really wanted to achieve. Fast forward a little bit on to 2016 when you were appointed captain um, with phenomenal success immediately um, got his promotion um, into the into that first division um, work in, you mentioned there spending time in division two we've been languishing in there too long really um, that was a tremendous Turnaround wasn't he appointed by Chris Silverwood as, as captain? Had you had much captaincy experience up until that point, Ryan? So I captained at university and obviously all throughout school, um, and then sort of never felt like a leader. Um, you know, just just the way it played out, and, and rightly so. You know, you've had your young guys going through the system here uh, from a young age, and guys like Mark uh, captained the team very well. Fozzie was was very good, um, but I, I did. Yeah, I happened to be able to draw back on, on you know how I'd done things back then and, and sort of try to bring in everything that I experienced from guys I played under and, and you know up to that 2016 season I played under some really good captains like I say Fuzzy um, but obviously the, the franchise tournaments as well. Um, Gautam Gambia who obviously came here as well I thought he was excellent and, and Brendan McCullum was sort of the guy I really wanted to, to model myself on so a mixture of that what I knew from back in the day um, and you know captaining a, a school team and a university team was really raw it's not about money it's not about um, you know contract you just there for the fun of it so I really try to make that a, a part of how I want to captain um, but yeah obviously going 17 15 16 years without captaining aside uh, it did take a bit of settling and, and getting used to and um, you know, luckily I had, I had the support of, of all the players and, and the great coaching staff to to get things moving uh, from day one pretty much. Having waited so long though to get into the first division and establish ourselves in the first division and then to win it, win the competition at the first time of asking, um, I mean it just doesn't happen by magic does it? What, what, what were the key elements do you think of changing um, a team that were if you like bumbling along, um, treading water sometimes it has to be said in, in division two into an all-conquering outfit. Um, obviously Chris Silver would have taken over as head coach, um, very demanding figure, um, but very loyal to the players. And I guess the same can be attributed to you. But there must have been something that you injected into that dressing room that shook people up. Um, look, I think how emphatically we, we won Div 2 was probably a good marker for us. And brutally honest, did we sort of set out to win Div 1? Probably not. Uh, that first day against Lancashire, that first game, gave us a lot of confidence. Um, but yeah, you know you can you can skirt around uh, great leadership or whatever you want. At the end of the day, it's about the players, and we were very lucky in the sense that the maturity of, of the batting group that was almost our peak years. You know, Dan matured way beyond his time. Nick Brown had become a fine player by then. Tom West had become an established player, and obviously Simon Harmer arrived at the club in twenty seventeen. Um, so you know, a mixture of those things and and a little bit what we we're chatting about in the steps earlier. Um, the success that you mentioned earlier there with the white ball stuff, it kind of perpetuated itself, you know, so you think, oh, you know, we've got the T20 next year, you know, Red Bull's really tough, if it doesn't quite go our way, we'll just make sure we, we produce something decent, but geez, we can win the, we can win the 2020 this year, we can, we can make finals there, we can 
have a real stab at the 50 over comp and I think there was a collective effort to say no hold on let's let's really have a crack at red ball cricket and you know that sort of became the the pride of the players they they wanted to do to do well in red ball cricket silvers laid the challenge out you know this is really tough if, if you want to do well in red ball cricket you can slip up once or twice you know can you perform 13 14 weeks out of 16 uh, and and that shift in mindset um, you know certainly gave us something to focus on and, and something that the team rose up uh, to that challenge but all those players i think would have known that the standards that were expected of them have been set by the head coach and yourself they knew that when they went into that dressing room uh, the standards they had to uh, aspire to um, and i think it certainly makes it easier if the head coach and the captain are actually showing their own hand and saying, well, I'm not asking you to do anything that we're not prepared to do. And you carry that, that along with you. Then. And then, as you alluded to there, winning things helps, doesn't it? That breeds confidence. Um, and that's an important factor as well in success. Yeah, I think change at any stage is good. Um, and, you know, probably it was the right fit of change at that time. Like I say, you know, the, the movement away from white ball cricket, but also two new voices, essentially. So you, you've had Paul Grayson and, and Fozzie you know, doing a fine job, but maybe just that small tinkering of, of mindset and, and like you say, the, the different approach to how to go about putting a good Red Bull campaign um, was something that's something that might have helped. But again, you, you, you can do what you want as a leader um, without the buying of the players and, and mainly the skill of the players. You, it's a non-starter. 2019, um, Essex shot the world again. We go and win the, uh, go and win the title again. Um, just to prove that 2017 was no fluke, was it actually harder to win that title in 2019 than 2017? Now you said earlier on that perhaps we surprised ourselves that uh, we, we actually went on uh, and won the title, surprised ourselves uh, as to what the expectations were at the start of the season. Uh, 2019 was very competitive, but again, we were absolutely outstanding, weren't we? Particularly towards the back end, um, so it was a totally different campaign to 2017 where you know, once we'd had had the lead we sort of ran away with it and we, we'd built up such a big gap that I think it was closed off with two full games still remaining. Um, so it was probably in the bag by early August whereas 2019 obviously went down to, to the last game but the big thing there was the confidence that the previous three campaigns had bred throughout the squad. I mean, it was ridiculous. So I, I remember the game in Hampshire we, where we came from behind. And we, we must have got like 130 ahead and the bowlers were coming to me and like, skip a call them in, we've got enough again. And we, we 130 ahead, eight down, and we ended up getting 180 or whatever. But you know, by then the, um, the blueprint was in place. Everyone knew what they had to do. We, we had a fine bowling lineup. Um, and, and the desire was there, you know, the, the joy that 2017 brought was, uh, you know, a different level of professional experience, you know, uh, personal experience that will live with all those guys and, and everyone who was involved in that campaign, as, as well as the, the backroom, you know, behind the scenes of the club and all the supporters. Um, and I think once you know what it's all about and, and once you know what's on the line, um, you know, you saw the way the guys fought in that Somerset game on a horrendous wicket. And again, one of the memories will be you know, Alistair Cook the great Sir Alistair Cook, how he was, how desperate he was to win the game, you know, pacing up and down, watching the clouds. Uh, he was a real wreck and, and I think that was, um, you know, that showed what it, what it meant to, to the team and, and, and the desire had never been stronger than those last few weeks of 2019. And you know, we went on to win the T20 under Simon Harmer, but you again wouldn't let the name move right and just kind of just slip off the pages. You played such an important part in getting us to that final, didn't you, particularly that uh, quarter final with Ravi um, up at the freezing, absolutely freezing chest of the street um, when we played Lancashire there on the sort of neutral ground, as it were. Um, that was a, a, a great performance, but you decided to stand down as captain of the Red Bull side at the end of the 2019 season. Was that because the demands on you as a captain? I mean, people think, oh, the captain just leads the team out of the field and whatever happens, happens. Uh, but there's a lot of off the field activities, isn't there? Demands of a captain. Were you feeling a bit drained by then, Ryan? Or did you feel it was just the right time for somebody else to take over the reins? Yeah, it, it was very draining. Um, you know, I threw my heart and soul into it, and uh, you, you'd, as much as you tried not to, you, you'd go home and think, about the next day's play, you know, if 
A happens, what am I going to do? You know, if B happens and they get the lead, how do we go to combating that? So it was very draining, but I also try to get ahead of the curve. And uh, what you see in sports teams is you, you see a team rise, 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 and you know, that's the curve. And then things start going badly and, and you sack your captain or you get rid of the coach. And so my idea was there, you know, could, could we on the upward curve, could we now change the voice and, and change the mentality and keep it going upward instead of waiting for the inevitable, uh, you know, this guy says the same, the same things. And, and it happens to everyone. It's, it's very, very difficult to, in that huddle, to say uh, non-generic things. So you say, oh lads, let's, let's put the pressure on, let's make sure we have fun. I mean, what does that mean? Yeah. If you hear that 150 times every time you go out to a session, I, I find it quite boring and, and, and I don't find it inspiring. And I thought, I started to run out of unique things to say, like really impressionable things to say, which was always something I, I, I tried really hard to do to, to give us a focus for those two hours or to sum up a game in a meaningful way. And I just thought, um, you know, if we could get a new voice there while I was still around, if they wanted to bounce things with me um, and, and sort of lead, lead the team in a slightly different direction with the principles all in place, I thought that's the way we could, we could keep the upward trajectory going. Right. Well, that's great. <coughs> I know we talked earlier on about the pride of, of you. Um, you always have great time for the likes of Keith Fletcher and Graham Gooch, and I know you've spent a lot of time with them, asking for their counsel and wisdom. Um, brought that into your game as and when, I'm sure you found it necessary. The fact that you've, you're right up there with them now, um, as far as, if you like, leg become a legendary figure, uh, Essex Cricket, which you have done, and I know you're very too modest to probably admit it, but you are, because I think you've laid the foundations for what could be the next golden era, golden period of the club, which Fletch and uh, Gucci got in the 70s, 80s, well, uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s anyway. Um, that would make you very proud, wouldn't it? That uh, you know you've gone some way, some part towards emulating what those two great uh, bastions of Essex Cricket, if you like, have achieved. I always refer to them as the, the godfathers of the club and you know, it, it really is a massive part of what we do. You know, you know, why do you do it? And, and part of it is the history and, and for those guys, uh, and amongst a few others, to show such keen interest in the club and to really give genuine support. I, I know that Tommy and, and Fletch are very close and Gucci was always that for me. Um, you know, forget the, the fact that he gave me the chance and that he ferried me to the airport at stupid hours in, in the first year I was here. <laughs> Uh, he, without fail, has been someone who would message me after a good win or a poor performance. Uh, just, a, just a small thing, you know, catch up once or twice a year just to, to give some inf influence and input on, on where I am, but what, where the team is, what can be done. Um, so, you know, people like that uh, along the way has certainly added to the focus and, and add to, added to the desire to, to carry on that legacy and, and, like you say, to achieve success where what it eventually or essentially at the end of the day it is about you know, we have to have a good time, we, we have for many reasons but at the end of the day you want to win things and uh, it, it's it's nice that this team or this group of players could emulate the success of um, 25 years ago as, as we now know and, and like you say the, the platform has been set there, the, this group of players it needs to perpetuate itself um, and you know cricket will come and go but the quality of people that you have in there is, is really important and that starts from the very top, from guys who played 40, 50 years ago, you know, how they uh, see the club, how they treat the club, what it means to them. And then you've also got good personalities in there, you know, from really good families and, and guys you can draw on when times are tough and you, you need to navigate your way um, through difficult times. We've concentrated on Essex, um, and we'll come back to that just in a while. But briefly as well, you made your mark globally as both playing for Netherlands, um, and the various T20 competitions around the world, the prestigious IPL, Big Bash, um, you know, that, that's taken its toll as well, I guess, at the, at, the, at the body run, because sometimes you've been pretty full on 12 months a year, haven't you, as a cricketer? But I guess there's a lot of rewards of playing with the, <laughs> with the world's best in those types of tournaments. And as you uh, mentioned earlier on, you pick up little tips from playing with these people, don't you? That, Perhaps you don't realise that they're going to be useful at some time, but later on in your life, when you take over as captaincy, you think, oh yeah, what would he have done? Yeah. Um, and that, that helps, doesn't it? Um, so you, you know, playing for Netherlands and the, the global competitions, um, again another feather in your cap. And guess uh, when you look back, you're very proud of those achievements. 
Yeah, it's a it's a slightly different sphere that. Um, so you know, obviously at Essex, you're accountable over a long period of time. Um, there's a real sense of long-term purpose, and I always try to take that wherever I went. You know, I hated it when I saw guys or where I felt guys were rocking up for a fee and they were there for four weeks or six weeks, and you know, let's have a bit of fun. Yeah, of course we want to win, but um, I always needed it to mean a, a little bit more to me, and it's probably coincidental. Um, but you know, Kolkata and Otago were very successful times for me, um, and next to Essex are sort of the two places that I, I really felt part of something. Uh, you know, Otago, a small little place in the backwaters of, of New Zealand. We had five fantastic years and we were very successful. Um, but the experience, and, and look, everywhere I went was, was phenomenal. You know, even the two horror stints in Australia where I didn't get a run, the, the guys were so good. Um, again, the, the structures and organisations were, were so nice to be a part of. Um, and I guess, you know, at some point I can look back on all those experiences, like you say, playing with the, the absolute greats um, and, and having a good time. Um, was a nice little sort of sideshow of, uh, of a career. Well, I think you used that as well to Essex benefit. Let's get back onto Essex as well because uh, for the whole series of T20 players, particularly that we would bring over and sometimes as overseas players, one of the first questions was, "How did you come? How did the? Uh, how did it come about that you got to Essex?" <laughs> Um, and if it wasn't Ryan Tindiscarla's name mentioned that it was for 95% of the time, it was Ravi Bapara. So between you, you were great ambassadors uh, for Essex. He might, he might have been thousands of miles away. Uh, but that's important though, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, when a club brings in an overseas player, they've got to have the ethos of the dressing room and they've got to be able to fit into the dressing room, and particularly that tight Essex dressing room where loners stand out um, and are very soon out, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, it's um, you know it's a great scouting platform, um, and it's one thing this club has done exceptionally well is the the quality of person that we brought into overseas. You know, at, at that level, you expect everyone to be world class. Um, but if I, if I look at the personalities we we've, we've brought in, um, geez, uh, we, we've been very very lucky. And you know, Sids, Wags, so just two that spring to mind. Obviously, over, over the short term, um, even Niche this year just fitted in nicely, but. Now those guys make such a big difference. Uh, Sid's has been a, a big part of, of what we're trying to do here and, and hopefully someone like him will be back uh, next year as well. So we come towards the close of the interview, let's, let's indulge Ryan Tendiscar. A couple of special memories that you have, Ryan. Your favourite innings or favourite match? Sure. Um, no, not really. I mean, the things I probably remember more are 2017 on this outfield, you know, when, when we celebrated lifting the cup, um, was a very special moment. Uh, you know, the, the marrying of everyone involved in the club on the outside, and then the 25 or 30 guys, whatever, in the dressing room um, who, had, who had done the work throughout the summer was, was a very special feeling. Uh, having all the family and, and all the staff sitting over there and in the bar afterwards, and then going up and doing our own thing will be a day I, I remember forever. Um, I remember on that, on that year, speaking to you, on one of, the, one of the very few occasions, perhaps the only occasion, where I think you almost lost for words when we beat the middle sex in that uh, day-night game with the pink ball, yeah. Harvey got nine wickets. Yeah. Um, and um, some, I think most of those second English wickets fell after tea on the last day. Um, it was an incredible yeah, performance, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, say, yes. It, even it, even uh, had you, uh, if you like, short of words, which is uh, you know not something that uh, is normally being a problem. But no. Spoken in interviews. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess uh, sort of as a as a marquee game and and a turning point because you know we just kept on winning in the 2017 year and. For me, three of the big victories were, that one was, was the biggest, you know, it really gave us the, the impetus to go on and, and finish the job. Um, Guildford, uh, where, where I decided to bowl first, um, and it didn't make sense at the time, and I think they were maybe like 3.50 for six overnight, and we looked like we messed it up, but everyone got, be got behind the decision, and, and we managed to turn that game around, we chased 200. And, 20 on the last day very easily and then the game at Scarborough as well um, you know where we won inside two days and pretty much everywhere across the country got rained off on day three and day four well, for me with the three games that propelled us to to go on and win it which gave us a big enough lead to, to sort of coast it towards the end 
Um, and then, the, you know, the 2019, the, the final game at Somerset, like I say, the, it was, everything was on the line, it was us or them. And, and the way guys showed desire in the change room, even just sitting around, was, was very stressful. Um, and that sort of encapsulated for me, you know, what it meant to, to every single player in, in the team. And, and our games I'll remember very fondly and very vividly. Something, isn't it, that players always say, um, sometimes it seems an old cliche, but I'm sure it's, it is meant with value, that individual performances don't mean, don't mean too much unless it's for the benefit of the team winning. Um, and you put in your performances so many times over the years, which have gone on to make a successful and winning side. Um, particularly bowling performance, um, one I remember, um, of yours, way back in 2010 against Hampshire, when you took five for 13. Again, um, in a remarkable session of play after T when Hampshire, it, the, the game was Hampshire's to lose, but somehow, not for the first time against Essex, they found a way to do it. Um, but quite remarkable, really, because I think the last uh, wicket uh, was caught by David Masters, who was fielding at leg slip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was also the only game we won in, in 20 whatever year, year that it was, 2010, yeah. I, I'm yeah. pretty sure. Yeah. But you're right, um, <laughs> the, the team prides itself on impactful performances. So, you know, a gutsy 70 on a, on a really tough pitch is, is far more uh, important than, you know, getting 250 and, and we draw the game on, on a flat one. Um, and I think Maggie in particular has been very good at, at sort of feeding that into the players. Um, you know, the impact that you have on specific games, which obviously then builds you up to where you end up in a in a league over a period of time um, and, and so certainly these two want players to to use that as a yardstick and, and to be fearless about going about winning small periods of, of play which, which build up to the bigger thing of, of winning sessions and matches. Well your career with Essex is, is over, your playing career anyway with Essex is over. Um, still got one last chapter to write. You're in the Netherlands squad for the uh, World Cup, aren't you? And I'm sure Ron Tenderskater's name will feature very prominently in, in, in that. Um, will that then be the final draw line under the career, Ryan? Yeah, th that's the plan. Um, you know, I think if there weren't that much on the line for the Netherlands in, in this T20, I probably wouldn't have gone. But if we can qualify to that first group, it gives them. Uh, entry into the next World Cup only because the two World Cups are, are back to back uh, with the postponement. Um, you know, I always say those are those showpiece events are, are actually far less important to the associate nations than the cycle in between where you have to get to those events. It's, it's obviously very important from a funding point of view and, and just staying in that top tier. Um, so, you know, if we get the job done, yeah, then then it will be will be done. Uh, if not, I might have to. Uh, throw my name in there to, to help them qualify for the next one. We'll go through the quali qualifying uh, phase again. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't see why I'll be playing any more cricket uh, after this incident with the Dutchies. Ryan, it's been a privilege and a pleasure to watch your career evolve from a raw rookie, if you like, that came over in 2003 uh, to somebody who's leaving Essex at the end of the 2021 season. Uh, you've grown to be a true legend, and I know that word's thrown around loosely sometimes, but in this case, thoroughly merited. You're up there with the greatest of Essex cricketers. Thank you for all the pleasure that you've given everybody. Thank you for your time. Cheers, Paul. Thanks so much.